Okay, good morning everybody. I'm going to try to talk a little louder so my microphone will pick me up. You know, the mask mutes me a little bit. I've turned the gain up on that, so hopefully that'll, that'll go well. Um, what I'm going to do today before we get started on anything that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about, we're going to take an, an inventory. Okay, so this is a learning strategies inventory. There's 11 questions. A is true, B is false. Be honest on it. Don't worry, you're, you know, you're not going to be graded on the number of true answers or false answers or if you got them right, because there is no right or wrong answer to this. But what you're going to do is you're going to print, please print, do not, you know, sign, sign it, but print your name up here so I can legibly read that. Then you're going to tear this off and you're going to put your answers on this zip grade form so I can use my phone to do all the, collecting all the data. Do not put your name on the zip grade form. Okay, I'm going to use the top page, which you will not write on, for your attendance today. So you will not have an attendance assignment that's due at 5 o'clock. Okay, this is it. This, then, I will use my ZipGrade app on my phone. I'll get everybody's data. And the next week, we'll talk about learning strategies. Okay? And so this is just kind of the assignment that we're going to do for that. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, so just a little less than a minute a question. Don't overthink it. Whatever comes to your mind first, yeah, I do that, that's true. No, I really don't do that. That's B, that's false, okay? And so you, it's just an assignment on being honest with yourself. So I'm going to pass these out. And you can get started right as you get them. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Um, has anybody ever filled out anything like that before? If you have, raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Yeah, so uh, that learning strategies inventory comes from a book called Teaching Students How to Learn, or Teaching Students to Learn. Uh, I think uh, it's important to think about how we think about things, or metacognition. I think it's important that we reflect on how it is that we learn um, and that we think about the different types of learning that we have to do. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about Bloom's taxonomy, just a little bit. I'm certainly not an expert um, in, in, uh, in that, but I do know that the different levels that uh, we experience in learning. And in college, we want to get you to that top part, where you're going to start adding value uh, to society, really, creating and, and analyzing. Uh, and I know that may sound harsh, creating, adding value to society, but just remembering things and being able to, to uh, regurgitate facts is no longer considered a high value uh, component in the modern world. We have computers, we have databases, we have Google, uh, we have lots of memory that can store facts and figures for us, and what we need a workforce and a citizenry to be able to do is to take that information, analyze it, develop new solutions to problems, create new things, uh, all of those types of things. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to work through all of that. But how we learn is um, a little unique for each one of us. Uh, there is a myth out there that uh, we all learn drastically different. I don't think that that's, that's true. Uh, but what we come into the classroom with, our experiences, um, all shape how we learn, where we struggle with learning, where we excel at learning. And everybody has strong points and everybody has uh, areas in where they can improve on in terms of their learning. And so um, in recent years, I've gotten interested in the scholarship of how uh, students learn uh, because I'm very interested in you all being as successful as you can be. And I think if you don't think about how you're, I'm using the word think a lot, if you don't think about how you think about things, uh, I think you're going to miss an opportunity uh, to get the most out of your college experience. So let's go ahead and, and jump into this presentation that I've been talking about for a couple of years. This, this presentation uh, is a couple of years old, but the title of it, uh, Stop studying and start learning. And I think by the end of this, you'll understand 
what I mean by that because when most people see that title to start with they go I thought I was supposed to study and, and I'm going to tell you why you really need to be in learning mode as opposed to studying mode and there is a difference so you know when I first presented this uh, several years ago in front of some faculty uh, they thought that this was heresy stop studying we want students to study well of course we want you to study right but we want you to stop studying at least as many of you practice it now okay I want you to get out of studying mode and get into learning mode most of the time okay and so let's let's see what I mean by that so let's think about some words that come to your mind when you think about study and learning okay so what words might come to your mind if you think about the word study? What other words come to, come to mind? Anybody? Review. Pardon? Review. Re review? Okay, very good. What else? What do you all do when you typically study now? It's okay. Memorize. Memorize. So review, memorize. What else? Read. Read. Highlight key part. Highlighting. Right? So as you're reading the book, maybe highlighting some key things to go back. Right? What else? Rewrite practice. Rewrite practice. Okay. Very good. How about when we think about the word, the word, <laughs> the word learning? Pardon? New. New? Okay. What else? Understanding, very good. What else? Questioning. Questioning. Okay. In some sense, many of you are probably struggling because you think of studying and learning as being almost synonymous with one another, right? And you're thinking, I don't want to duplicate words that we've already used. And it's okay to have a little bit of duplication. But what you see on the study side right some of some of the words you all came up with and there were a few others right but you might have come up with reading review research exercise homework cramming or memorizing that might have been studying to you many of you think about studying oh I need to put together a study group we've got a test tomorrow that's cramming right or reviewing what's the difference between cramming or reviewing is the amount of time you give yourself to do it okay that's the real difference learning you'll see that there are some different words many of you thought of train I think I heard training research is probably going to be a similar word wisdom you think of people who are wise and have been have they've learned a lot you don't necessarily think of a wise person as just somebody who studies but somebody who's learned you think of uh, attainment or permanent, right? You think if, if you've learned it that it's really hardwired into your brain, whereas studying, maybe it's there for a short period of time. Understanding, I think I heard that word. And transferability. You all are going to learn things, at least I hope you learn things, in some of your lower level classes that you transfer into your higher level coursework. As you all are putting together your personalized semester by semester guide and you're looking at prerequisites, those prerequisites are there because we hope you have learned something in those prerequisite courses that is needed to transfer into the course for which that is a prerequisite too, right? The things you're learning in general chemistry this semester or the things that you're learning in organic chemistry depending on where you're at in your, in your studies we expect you to learn much of that information to transfer it into when you get into a higher level course like physical chemistry or instrumental analysis or biochemistry when you all get into biochemistry many of you are on the biochemistry track you're going to be talking about proteins and fats and lipids and cellular components all of which are made up of carbon which class do you learn about carbon in organic. organic chemistry not biochemistry they expect that you understand 
that carbon can have five bonds, that it takes a tetrahedral shape, that it can have many hybridizations. Because all of those pieces that you learn in organic chemistry, aside from the reactions, are going to be day one in, in, in biochemistry. That's why a protein has its shape. That's why a fatty acid has its properties that allow it to function as a lipid membrane on a, on a cell surface, right? Uh, so you're going you're to use all of that information, okay? That's why our curriculum is layered the way that it is, okay? It is a little more stringent in that regard. You have to have certain prerequisite courses, okay? But that's because we hope that you have learned something before you move on. What I want you to know is that I want you to transfer your mindset from studying to learning. Try to use that word more than you use the word study. You know, when you're getting together with a group of friends to study, think mentally. I'm going to get together with a group of friends to learn. Okay? That will help start getting you into this learning mode. And it is very important. If you learn the material, when we say you need to learn the material, you're going to do just fine in this major. Okay? You will excel in this major. You will go on to graduate school, medical school, you will do very, very well, I promise you. Okay? Uh, if you stay stuck in the study mode, where you learn it just for the exam and then you flush it, this is probably not the major for you. The good news is, is that these modes are not wired into you. You all can choose to be in one or the other. Okay? So let's think of an example. Let's suppose that I tell each and every one of you that next week you're going to have to teach a class on a specific topic. Okay? I'm going to say you have to come to class next week, you have to be up here, and you have to teach a topic to the class. Right? You're going to have to prepare for the class. You're going to have to prepare any materials, a presentation, activities, whatever that topic might require in order to satisfy my expectations of teaching a class. So, when I give you the topic, are you going to study that topic or are you going to learn that topic? You're going to learn that topic. Why, why would you really want to learn that topic as opposed to studying that topic just because you're up here? You have to answer questions. You don't know exactly what's coming down the line, right? And it's a little intimidating, right? To be up here kind of purports that you're an expert. <laughs> and you're going, oh my gosh, I've got this topic. I've got a week to prepare. I've got to become an expert at this because I don't know what Megan might ask, right? I have no idea what might be coming down the line. So I better know this material when I get there. Why should that be any different than when you get ready to take an exam in, in one of your classes? It shouldn't be, right? You really need to be in that learning mode. Okay, and I, I would guarantee you the vast majority of you will spend a heck of a lot more time preparing for the class that you needed to teach than you will need to prepare for an exam. If I took half the class and I said, go prepare for an exam, Many of you would study for a few hours and then be done with it. If I took the other half of the class, I said, you all have to go prepare to teach this topic. You all would go to the library. You would be questioning each other. You would be trying to figure out what people are going to ask. You really would be trying to learn it more deeply. Okay? So what does that tell you all? It really tells us that you all need to try to prepare to teach in order to learn, okay? You all really need to prepare to teach in order to learn. And as you can see from the uh, Latin, descendo dismus, by teaching we learn. That is absolutely true. I went and got my undergraduate degree, had a bachelor's in chemistry. I went to graduate school, got my PhD, went on to do my postdoctoral work at Vanderbilt for a couple of years. And then before I came here, I got an offer to teach at Vanderbilt for a year. And I can tell you 
that I realized how much I didn't know because I had to go teach a classroom of freshmen a course in chemistry that was for non-majors. I had to go back and really learn some of the previous stuff that I'd taken for granted. Because as I went up, I became more and more narrowly focused on a topic. And I was an expert on free radical chemistry by the time I was done with my postdoc. I could have gone and lectured to a bunch of Nobel laureates on free radical chemistry at that point. But I had been a while since I'd used uh, some of the equations from Gen Chem, <laughs> right? I had lost a lot of that. By teaching, you really do have to learn and know the material, okay? And so that is a strategy that I think you all really need to employ. Most of you are not going to become teachers. Some of you will by profession. But each and every one of you will be teachers at some point in some form or fashion, whether it's through you're going to have children and you've got to deal with their stuff. Uh, you're go, you go to work and you have to train a new person. Uh, you go to medical school and you're you know, a, a senior resident and you have new residents coming in and you've got to show them the ropes. You all are going to have to be teachers. That is one of the things that defines all professions and even most of the trades. If you were a tradesman, or a tradesperson, I guess I should say, right, you have these things called apprentices, and those are folks that you have to train, right? So really, we all need to take an eye towards, towards teaching. You know, uh, obviously this is a relatively small class, but when I teach organic, and I haven't in, in a few years, but when I do, you know, I'm in a big lecture hall with up to 180 students. You know, I don't know what those 180 students are going to ask me on any given day. I had better be prepared for class when I walk in, right? And so I really do think um, teaching is an important part of how you learn. That's why we talk about getting in groups to study, to learn, right? Have learning groups as opposed to study groups. But when you go, don't be a, it sounds bad, but don't be a parasite, right? Don't just go to hear what other people have to say. Participate. Student A is going to know more about a particular topic than you do. But you're going to know a little bit more than somebody else. And you all can work, for, uh, work with each other to, to really build that. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about how we learn. I think... Learning is one of those things that it's a word that we all use and very few of us really understand. Uh, I think by the time people get to college, you will have professors who say, well, they should have learned, they should have learned how to learn in high school. All right, fair enough. Probably should have. Many don't. I didn't. <laughs> um, you know, that's just the way it is. I really like this cartoon. Uh, two little kids and a dog. One says, I taught Stripe how to whistle. The other kid kind of leans down to Stripe. I don't hear him whistling. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. Right? That is important. I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. I can teach, but I cannot learn you. And I know that sounds weird because it's not grammatically correct, right? But learning is a partnership between teacher and student, right? Your professors come to class to provide you with their expertise. You have to find a way to learn it. They will help you. But most of your professors, especially in the sciences, have absolutely no training in how to teach or how to make you learn. Right? Uh, I would wager that aside from the people who are licensure in, in, in the department, I'm probably the only faculty member who had any training on teaching and pedagogy by the time I got my job. And that was just pure luck before where I was at. When I was at Vanderbilt, they had a program called 
uh, F2P2, a future faculty preparation program. I attended some things and I learned, I didn't open my eyes. I was like, huh, <laughs> who knew you could study all this stuff? I thought people just knew how to learn. But that's why I first got my uh, toe wet with it, so to speak, okay? So there is a difference. In the paper that I put in the um, canvas shell, right, this comes from that paper by Worth and Perkins, Learning to Learn. It's a paper that I highly recommend you all read. But it talks about the learning cycle. When you look at this learning cycle, what comes to mind for you? What does it resemble? Okay, looks at different ways of learning, absolutely. What else comes to mind? In a way, it's kind of like the scientific method in a way, right? There's similarities. And guess what? The scientific method is a method by which we learn things. Right? You're in a discipline that has an entire method that is built out over centuries on how to act to know that we've learned something. Knowing something is different than learning something. It's easy to know a few things. I know that the sun is big, it's hot, it's nuclear powered. It's a different thing to know how it works. Right? But through the scientific method or through this Kolb's learning cycle, we can start to understand things and really learn, right? And so you've got concrete experience, feeling, right? Our experiences. Notice how all of these things have our experiences coming in, right? I could bring in an object and I could say, learn something about this object. And many of you would walk up to it and you would start touching it, you would hold it. You would move it around, you would have that concrete experience with it. Oh, this is heavy. It's probably not made of styrofoam, <laughs> you know, given its size. Right? You'll do some reflective observation. You'll see how other people are interacting with it, right? That's watching. Right? If you've ever apprenticed in anything, I was an electrical apprentice before I went to college. I watched the master electrician and how they did their work. Okay, that was fine. At some point you gotta feel it though, right? You gotta do something with it. Abstract conceptualism, this is where you're starting to think about it. Right, I bring the object in, you've watched people interact with it, you've interacted with it, now you're starting to think about it. Huh, it's kind of heavy. It's pretty small, must be pretty dense. Maybe it's made of lead. Oh wait, maybe it could be made of gold. Probably not, it's big, and that would be expensive, right? You can start to think and work your way through it. Then, once you've done that, and you've probably formed some hypotheses, we'll talk about the scientific method later in the semester, then you're gonna probably start doing some active experimentation. Huh, I've got this object, it's heavy, it's probably lead. If it's lead, it should have a certain color if I scrape it, it should be a little shiny. You might do that experiment. Or you might say, well, that's a metal. Metals conduct electricity. You might try to see if it conducts electricity. You might do something else, okay? This is how we learn. You do not learn from reading a book in and of itself. You do not learn just by doing the homework exercises, okay? You do not learn by simply getting all the answers correct. Okay? We learn by a variety of different methods, but this is what really plays into that. Okay? So there's a lot of experiences that you need to keep in mind as you think about your learning and as you learn. When you come to a point in college, and it will happen if it hasn't happened already, where you get frustrated, points of frustration are where we learn. That's, we're pushing the boundary of our knowledge. We're pushing the boundary of our understanding. Okay? If it all comes easy to you, congratulations. 
For most of you, it won't. It still doesn't come easy to me. There are some things in chemistry that make my head hurt when I think about them, especially quantum things, right? And that's okay, but I, you think about it, you learn more, you move forward. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have failures. Those things are learning moments. When you get a test back and you don't do as well as you thought, many of you are going to get angry. Have your moment and then calm down and then learn. Okay? Your emotions will drive you a little bit, but don't let them control you completely. Okay? I had a student, this has been several years ago now, he's now employed with Thermo Fisher nationwide. He's, he's actually a very successful uh, young man. He took my organic class. And his first exam, when I handed the exam back, he wadded it up and threw it away. And I went and got it out of the trash can and I gave it back to him. I said, you're going to want this. He made an appointment with me. We went over all of the stuff with him after he had tried to do it. We found out where his learning issues were with the material and we solved that problem. He went on to get a very good grade in my class. He ended up graduating very well, no problems got the job he was after, and now, he, now he's successful. But imagine what would have happened if he had just left that in the trash can and walked away. He would have missed an opportunity to learn, right? In the sciences, we're in the business of failure. Most experiments fail. That's where we learn, and we move on. Scientists, we have to write grants to get money to fund our research. The funding rate is much less than 50%. I know every time I submit a grant that the odds of it being funded are slim. To put it in another perspective, every Saturday, half of the athletic teams lose. But then on Monday when they're back in, what do they do? They watch film. They use that as a learning opportunity, right? So don't view failures as the end, <laughs> okay? It's, a failure can be seen as the beginning of a learning moment. And everything that you do in college is low stakes compared to when you get in the real world. If you fail on a single quiz, you can recover. If you fail in that heart transplant, somebody dies, okay? So, very important. Repeat performance is very important, right? If you've ever watched athletes practice, they repeat things over and over again to where it becomes muscle memory, or what they call muscle memory. I don't know if that really exists, but that's what they call it, right? You can't work just one chemistry problem and then go, oh, I know that concept, because there's a thousand ways to throw that at you, and you need to know the thousand ways. How we interact with others. These are great learning experiences. Learning groups or study groups as you all call them, right? And then we also have to include personal reflection. This is why I'm having you do notebook reflections. I want you to be practiced at how to reflect on something. When I say write a paragraph about whatever, I want you to deeply reflect on what that means to you. It's not that there's a right answer or a wrong answer necessarily, but what does that mean to you? This is all going to be very, very important as you all learn to learn and study better, right? And I know I shouldn't be using the word study, but it's one that we use all the time. But you all understand what I'm saying. This is Bloom's taxonomy. Okay. You'll know at the bottom I put Homer Simpson. <laughs> uh, kind of as a joke. At the top, you know, somebody or something creating something, right? All of these are important. Remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Where do you think you were when you came out of high school? Remembering? <laughs> Okay, well, we probably hope that you were a little higher up than that, right? But yeah, 
In high school, you were probably somewhere in here when you graduated, right? You were able to recall facts, you were able to write an essay, basically tell the teacher what they kind of wanted to hear, you know, that kind of thing. In college, by the time you graduate, we want you to be up here. We want you to be able to go into society, get a job, whatever that may be for you, and we want you to create things. We want you to create economic value. We want you to create social value. We want you to create citizenship value. All across the board, we want you to be able to participate as a citizen, right? To do that, you're going to not only have to be able to understand things, but you're gonna to have to be able to analyze them. You're gonna to have to be able to place them in context and you're gonna to have to be able to evaluate them. For those of you going on to be a doctor, you will have to do this all the time. We call it triage. Can you imagine what it's like right now during the pandemic to be a doctor when you have no beds, you've got patients coming in and you've gotta make a decision about who gets priority and who doesn't. But that's analyzing and evaluating, right? It's creating value for, for the, the society as a whole, right? It's not just remembering that, oh, COVID's bad, <laughs> or COVID needs a vaccine, or whatever, right? It's, it's about more than that. So we want you to be able to get up to the top of the pyramid, as, as Bloom has, has outlined it here. Um, and, and each one of these is important, obviously, Obviously, when you're in an emergency situation, you can't go Google everything. There's some things that you have to be able to remember. There's some things you have to understand, you have to be able to apply, so on and so forth, right? But in general, in a non-emergency situation, a lot of these lower level things now are handled by databases and computers and Google search engine, right? We can, we can go back and figure out some things, right? I can go look up an equation as long as I remember that that equation is used in this particular area to figure out whatever it is I'm trying to figure out. And then I can plug and chug. But I'm doing that as part of creating something bigger. All right. Metacognition is a very important part of your learning process. Uh, there is a book by uh, Dr. McGuire. Uh, Dr. McGuire was at LSU for many years. She's retired now. I've seen her talk. Uh, and she was in charge of, of a learning center. She was a chemistry professor, but got put in charge of a learning center. And she had huge gains in students' learning abilities by doing a few simple things. And so from her years of experience, she wrote this book on how to teach students how to learn. Okay, And so through this 50 minutes that I'm talking to you today, I'm hoping to transfer some of that to you, okay? Uh, and so metacognition was a very important part of her strategy for all of her students. And in fact, the learning strategies inventory that you all completed at the beginning of class is where all this came from, okay? The first thing that you need to do is you need to preview before you go to any one of your classes, you need to preview the topic of the day. Why is that important? Okay, maybe not an understanding, but you at least have a familiarity with the topic. I view this as the primer that you, you would use when you're doing painting. It prepares the surface to, to receive something, right? What is that surface? It's your brain. If you walk into class and have no idea what the topic of the day is, you're not going to learn much because your brain's going to be trying to figure out where that should go. But if you know in, in General Chem 1 today that you're going to be talking about uh, you know, a, a portion of the periodic table, if you preview that before you go to class, you will be prepared better to accept that information. You need to prepare for active reading. 
There's, there's a couple of types of, of reading. There's the reading that we do for pleasure. A lot of times for me, that's, uh, I, I have trouble getting to sleep, so I'll read something. And I'll read that. Uh, I'll fall asleep. How much do you think I remembered the next day? I remember a few bits and pieces. I could probably summarize what the chapter was maybe a little bit about, but I couldn't get into any detail, right? Active reading is very, very important. You need to be able to actively read such that you are at, in a high level of, of learning, okay? You need to paraphrase. If you read a paragraph that's highly technical, you should be able to paraphrase that into a sentence, a sentence of understanding. In fact, for much of what you all will be reading, because most of what you all will be reading in your science classes anyway is highly technical, you should be able to take a page of information that you've gotten out of your active reading and condense it to a sentence or two. Okay? You've got to be able to paraphrase things. Again, then you, you need to actively read. You need to use your textbook correctly. This is no joke. I had a student one time, came to me, said, I'm having trouble. I said, well, let's look in the textbook. And when they opened it, I heard it crack. I'm like, you just spent over $200 for the organic textbook. You're complaining to me about how expensive it is. <laughs> and it's never been opened. I don't care if your book costs $10 or $200. If you don't use it, it's wasted money, right? You need to know how to use your textbook. In a textbook, you never just start reading the first page and, and work your way through. You skim. You prepare your brain for what is coming, right? Your, your textbook is broken up into pieces. You have sections. When you finish a section, you should be able to paraphrase what that was. You should be able to work some problems. Okay? You need to be able to use that textbook correctly. Okay? You need to attend class and take notes by hand if possible. There's something about doing this that helps us learn more so than this. I don't know what that is, but people who study it, this is true. You need to do your homework without using examples when assigned. What does that mean? It means you start off doing that example or that homework problem without referring to your notes or anything. See what you know. Okay? I used to put a solutions manual on reserve in the library back when we had paper copies of all this stuff. It was the most checked out thing in the library for five years in a row. And there were some mistakes in it. And even the writing mistakes, the, the Spelling mistakes were, were copied onto people's homework, right? That's not what they're there for. They're there to help you when, you've, when you run into a brick wall. Okay, now I refer to that and see what I can do. You need to teach the material. Dr. McGuire even gave the example of a student who was quite the introvert and decided to teach the material to his plant. Okay. Now, could you know that the, that the plant learned anything? Of course not. But it was the act of trying to teach something that was important. So, you know, you need to, to spend some time teaching the material. I highly recommend you work in groups. It's very important, though, when you think about it, do not get into study, study groups of people who are all in the same boat. I've seen that over and over again, where somebody would be in my organic class, or a group of people, and then they would eventually come to me and they say, we've been studying, we've been studying, we've been studying, we just can't get it. And I'm going, each and every one of you has a D in the class right now. <laughs> That's not the right group. You know, you got together and you complained about my homework. You got together and you complained about the test. You need to find people who have strengths that you don't have, and you need to bring a strength to that group that they don't have. 
Okay, that's the, that's the great thing about working in groups. And the tenth thing that Dr. McGuire says is you need to create your own exam. Before an exam, you need to sit there and create your own exam for the material that's coming. What do you think is going to be on the exam? Right? Thinking that way will help you learn that material better. And then I've added 11, an 11th, which is personal reflection on your performance. Very important piece of metacognition, in my, my opinion. In fact, there it is. It got bigger, <coughs> right? So, uh, Dr. McGuire published this thing called the study cycle. Um, you need to preview the material before class. The night before is fine. Even 30 minutes before. If you've got a break in between classes, preview for the next one. Okay? It doesn't take much time. You need to attend class. <laughs> okay? I want you all to think about this, or at least when I put this together. You all are paying the university 50 cents for every minute you're in class. 50 cents per minute. 60 minutes per hour, that's $30 per hour in class time, okay, minimum. Anybody in here make $30 an hour? Some may. There are very few students who make $30 an hour, and yet they will skip a class because they had to work. That eco economics don't add up. Right? Uh, it just doesn't. So remember, you're paying for an opportunity. Don't waste it. You need to review the material after class as soon as you can. Not immediately, right? But within the day, at some point, you need to at least review what happened in the class. Right? Make sure you're in learning mode. She says study, but let's get you into learning mode, right? Go back. And then you've got to assess and then repeat. Okay, what is the assessment for a chemistry major? It's working problems, right? It's working those problems, figuring out where you have issues, going back and studying those issues better, and that's a cycle. And so I like to call this the learning cycle as opposed to the study cycle, but it works either way. There is a technique that I think you all will find very useful. I will post a video. There's, a, there's several videos out on YouTube about it. It's not my video. But the Feynman technique. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize physicist. This is how he learned. He, ta he was famous for telling people, I'm really not a genius. I just know how to learn better than most people. Right? He was a genius. <laughs> but... Uh, so in a nutshell, the Feynman technique is, if you don't, uh, you don't understand a topic, if you can't explain it in simple terms to your grandmother, your grandfather, or a young child. If you have to use a lot of technical jargon, and you have to say things like, well, you know, you know, you know, you don't know it, right? So in his technique, step one, he says, get a notebook, take a piece of paper, write the title at the top of the concept you wish to know or learn about on the top of the page, and then write down everything you know about that concept on that page. If you start filling multiple pages, you're just, you're not, you're not condensing it. You're not learning it. Okay? You're just regurgitating a bunch of stuff. Second step is explain that concept in simple terms. Think about it. Hey, can I explain this to my, my roommate who happens to be an art major? There's nothing wrong with art but they're probably not taking all your chemistry classes, right? Can I explain what this means to them? Or your, or your, you know, your friend over in the business school. Step three is to review your explanation and identify areas where you struggle to explain it in simple terms. That's self-reflection. Okay, now you go back to the books and your notes, whatever you need to go back to, and try to learn as much as you can about those areas where you struggled with, okay? You need to be able to use analogies. That's where transferability comes in. Okay? Very, very important. For those of you who don't know, Richard Feynman uh, was on the 
Challenger disaster panel. And he's famous for doing this little experiment with a piece of the rubber O-ring with a cup of ice water. We explained to them why, because it was cold that day, the shuttle disaster occurred. He was able to take a very complicated physics and engineering problem and digest it down to a demonstration of a cup of ice water and a piece of material. He understood what the problem was. He didn't sit there and talk about material properties and tensile strengths and brittleness and all this stuff. He was able to digest it down because he truly understood what the issue was. Okay? This is an example of doing something for the Feynman technique. Just an example of carbocation rearrangement. For those of you who've had organic chemistry, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, you'll learn it, right? One page, everything that I know about it and how I can explain it. Basically, a carbocation is a carbon atom that doesn't have eight electrons, and it will rearrange the things that are connected to it to become more lazy, more energetically stable. I could explain that to my mom. She would understand that. Oh, yeah, I understand. Things don't want to be, you know, high energy. They want to be lower energy. Most people can understand that. All right, and the last thing I want to spend just a moment talking about is mindset. I highly recommend you go to the website that's there. Each and every one of us has a mindset. We either have a growth mindset or we have a fixed mindset. And I will post an, a video next week on mindset that will explain it a little better than what this one slide is going to do today. The good news is we are not born with a mindset. We develop a mindset. We can change our mindset. But if you find yourself viewing failure as a limit to your abilities, or I'm not good at something, or I don't like to be challenged, uh, or I'm, you know, when I get frustrated, I'm just like, well, I'm not good at that, I'm going to go on and do something else. You have a fixed mindset. If, however, you view failure or challenges as something that can, you can learn from and grow from, you're in a growth mindset. If you like to try new things, if you view feedback as constructive, you have a growth mindset. Each and every one of you can switch from one to the other. I highly recommend you be in the growth mindset. Okay? When you get that first exam back at midterm that's not where you wanted to be, you will know which of the two mindsets you're in. If you find yourself in a fixed mindset, I hope you try to find a way to become more growth mindset oriented. Because no matter what you change your major to or think, oh, I, I'm not good at this, I'm going to change my major, you will run into those types of issues in any major. Okay? And if you only do what you're quote unquote good at right now, you're not growing. Right? You're not getting your full value out of your college education. Okay? That doesn't mean that there's not good reasons to change your major. Some of you will. You have different, different um, things that you might want to do. And that's fine. But whatever you do, I want you to have a growth mindset about it. Okay? All right, so we are done for the day. Um, I will analyze these learning strategies inventories. We'll talk more about that next week. Don't forget, next week, uh, on the 17th, right, is do your personalized semester-by-semester semester guides. So don't put it off. It will take more time than you think. Have a great rest of the week, and I will see you next week.